Welcome uh, to all of you uh, to this 45 minutes webinar. Uh, we have called it Explore Leadership Through Another Set of Lenses with author and facilitator of learning, Steve Hall. Uh, my name is Adam Altenberg and I'm director at ABT, uh, what we call a learning institution with a purpose and aim of educating professionals and managers in strategic thinking and uh, leadership. I think I will start by saying that in 2012, I found myself standing on a bustling marketplace close to a local train station, downtown Durban, South Africa. The noise was tremendously loud. Hundreds of people were screaming their best bargains to anybody near, in Sulu, of course. Small groups were performing rural tribe dances, dressed in beautiful skins and hides from wild animals which I later learned was impalas and springboks. It was pretty chaotic, seen from my North Hemisphere lenses, a traveler who had spent less than half a day in the country after a very long journey. I was enrolled in a leadership program that included delegates from the area and neighboring countries. And here I found myself in a team activity and the group has just been thrown off the minivan into this crazy place. To my relief, uh, I spotted one of my fellow teammates who seems like a person to stay close to, full of energy, smile, and awareness. He was already engaged with chit-chatting with an elderly lady. I think it was a fruit stall holder, uh, asking, you know, market questions and insights and directions. I felt a connection. It seemed like he was on a personal journey and adventure just like me. This was my first experience with Steve Hall. And since then, uh, we have had many unforgettable moments and learnings from the challenge townships and the incredible bush known as the South African Savannah. Today, I'm very delighted to have uh, the opportunity to introduce you, Steve who besides being a personal friend also is a deeply passionate and inspiring person with a unique understanding of people and cultural complexity and with a great heart when it comes to environmental and nature appreciation. And of course, you are an excellent storyteller. In this presentation, we'll learn that we are all, that we can all decide which polarity that should affect our observations and how we like to embrace the world. We can, so to speak, apply another set of lenses. A final comment uh, before we are starting. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the uh, chat function, which you find below the screen or below the video. And at the end, we will take as many questions uh, as the time allows us to. So finally, good morning to you, Steve, again. And uh, how are you down there? Good morning, Adam. Uh, it really is fabulous to be with all of you from AVT. Uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I have a very, very deep connection with the Danes, not only because of you, Adam, and the extraordinary people that I've met through you and your network, uh, and a couple of visits to Copenhagen, which have remained some of my highlights. But I come from Danish heritage. So from the 1600s, I came from a family called Yepi. Or in South Africa, it's known as Jeppi. And there is still today in downtown Johannesburg a Jeppi's town and a Jeppi's boys high school uh, from one of the original Danish explorers who came out to, to South Africa. So I feel a, a deep connection. What you spoke about in that marketplace, Adam, uh, was what the ancient Greeks call a kairos moment. It's a moment that never, ever disappears. You know, they had many... Uh, concepts of time, the ancient Greeks, they talked about chronos, they talked about kairos, and they talked about eons. And chronos is chronological time. When the time just passes by, there are 45 minutes in this webinar, and therefore it's a linear concept of time. Each minute is just like the other minute, and every minute is made up of 60 seconds. No second is any different to the other. But a kairos moment is when the clock stops when something in the marketplace catches your attention, when you notice the colors and the skins and the dancing, when you notice somebody talking to a street trader, and that forms a moment which perhaps lasts for eons. And so I hope really you brought me all the way back to the Durban markets uh, in that introduction. And I hope that this is a Kairos moment 
for you and for the delegates that are here with us for this chronos period of time. I hope it lasts for some degree of eons. And so thank you very, very much for having me. I'm going to share some slides, some thoughts, uh, and potentially some stories from a book that I wrote. Um, you might ask, well, why did I write the book? Uh, during lockdown, my diary suddenly disappeared, literally erased within 48 hours from a full booking sheet of facilitations and immersions and conferences to zero. Uh, we were into full lockdown in South Africa with uh, very little chance of interacting in the old way. Um, some context around South Africa, which maybe, uh, you know, you might be interested in. Um, you can Google so much. Yeah, you know, we've got a population of around about 60 million. It's a country that's about twice the size of Texas in America, if that gives you any indication. We've got 11 official languages, which makes it incredibly complex, incredibly diverse. Uh, in the world of diversity, there are more flower species on Table Mountain in Cape Town alone than there are in England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland all combined. Uh, we have 850 kilometers of the longest wine route in the world, uh, so it's worth a visit just for that. Uh, but it is a place of extraordinary, extraordinary diversity. Uh, and allow me to just maybe read a paragraph from my book, which might place some context uh, on the talk. We have magnificent landscapes, but high levels of environmental degradation. Beautiful beaches, but lots of litter. We have stories of untold love and unspoken hatred, cringeworthy cowardice and headline heroics. We have the beautiful big five, but we are battered by brutal poaching. And we have both snakes and statesmen in the seats of control. As a country, we have been shown visionary leadership from global icons and have been robbed blind by the greedy. We have shown others the light while we've been the electricians of our own darkness. This land will make you laugh from the deepest bowels of your soul, but it will also make you cry real tears. There is never a dull moment in this land and there is no middle ground. It is not easy to be a fence sitter in this place. We have stories in this country of atrocious inhumanity. We also have stories of courage, of care, and of kindness, of selfless serving, of humility, of humor, and of hope. We have stories of humanity. And I think it was actually that context, Adam, that really got me thinking about this particular story. What are we living here in South Africa? How are we viewing the world around us? Uh, and although the book is not my story, of course, there are elements of my story that emerge. So allow me to take you all through a little journey of some exploration. The main uh, context, or I suppose model or spine of the book emerged from an experience that I had with Stephen Covey, working for the Covey Leadership Center in the 1990s in Provo in Utah. I was fortunate enough to be trained as a facilitator of the seven habits, and I thought this would be a fabulous lens through which to see the world. It was a time in South Africa where things were changing. It was now the mid 90s. We were moving out of apartheid into, uh, into a democratic system. Nelson Mandela had been released and it was an extraordinary time. Uh, it was a, a moment where I never forget a specific model that to a large degree has made up many, much of the thinking of my book. Covey referred to this as the basic change model. In simple words, it starts with a three letter word called C. We have pictures of the world. We have paradigms, we have mental mind maps, we have the way we see things. And that is influenced by so much around us. The markets you went to in 2012, Adam, had pictures that changed your mindset. You looked at the world differently. Uh, when we see the world through a new set of lenses, uh, we are able to attach more meaning. Those pictures may come from a religion or from an upbringing or from rituals or from culture or certainly from past experiences and certainly even from the media. We often joke on our leadership programs that your view of America is dependent on whether you watch CNN or Fox News. And that might give you a totally different picture of the world. 
you can hear the word uh, Maldives and you will have pictures in your mind of diving or of palm trees or of lovely cocktails or of beautiful blue seas. You can hear the word dentist and you will immediately have different pictures in your mind due to past experiences uh, or propaganda that your mother showed you of people with bad teeth. And so our pictures to a large degree inform our behaviors. We do what we do because we see what we see. The way we behave is so dependent on the way we see the world. If I see the world as a friendly place, then my behaviors are perfectly predictable. I will be open and honest and approachable. But if I see the world as an unfriendly place, and it's a polarity we'll explore, then perhaps my behaviors are also perfectly predictable. I may not engage, I may withdraw, I may withhold information, I may not choose to engage. I'll, we do what we do because we see what we see. Of course, this results in an outcome. We get what we get because so often we do what we do. Yes, there is this thing called luck. You know, sometimes we do something really well, but we just don't get the right outcome. We put together a great proposal. We don't get the sale. Okay, well, that was bad luck. Sometimes you play an awful shot on the golf course. <clears throat> it shanks off the club. It hits a tree and it bounces back into the fairway. Well, it wasn't a good action, but you got a good result. It's called good luck. It's hard to base our strategy on luck, good or bad. Generally speaking, we get what we get because we do what we do. And then, of course, when we get what we get reinforces the picture, these things become habits. And this works beautifully well when we are happy with the outcomes. When we are happy with the results we're getting, we continue to see the world through the same lenses. You see, it's a good thing to brush your teeth. And so we, we brush our teeth and we get fresh breath and healthy gums and a beautiful partner. And you see then it's a good thing to brush our teeth. And so we locked into the cycle of good habit. What's fascinating is what occurs when we are not happy with the results we get. And so what I try to explore is not only that we need to then maybe re-examine our behaviors, but what are the underlying pictures? What are the underlying paradigms? What are the underlying polarities or viewpoints or mental mind maps that may be influencing the behavior, that may in fact be causing the behavior? And so what I tried to do was that I tried to twin six major questions that I've always been asked as a facilitator of learning. How does my team uh, get more constant learning and innovation? How, as a second question, might we encourage more generosity and sharing? How do we get a better sense of relationship in our team? Things like trust and belonging. What about collaboration? You know, I really want my team, I want my organization to collaborate. Let's do some workshops about collaboration. What about integration? And that is kind of joining the dots, making sense of the meaning around us. Uh, muddling through all this incredible information we're given and making sense of it through integration. And lastly, how do I get more fully charged engagement out of my team? And these seem to have been six constant themes throughout more than 25 years of facilitation uh, throughout the world that have kept me fascinated. And yet often there is no necessarily particular answer. I've always been inspired by the words of Rainer Maria Rilke, who says we should live our questions now, live our questions now. And then someday, maybe far into the future, we will live ourselves into, the, into our own answers. And so these are simply explorations. They are simply maybe questions uh, and they might not have an exact answer because the answer for you might be very different to the answer for me or the answer to the next delegate. And so six polarities that I've tried to outline in the book. And I like the use of the word polarity because they really are polar opposites. Think of a polarity like breathing. You know, breathing supports life. So a polarity must be a balance to support something else. Uh, and when we breathe, we are supporting the very act of life. We have to inhale on the one side. And the polar opposite of that is, of course, we have to exhale too. One is not right and one is not wrong. It is a combination of these polarities which give us the balance of breathing. 
we, we don't only go away for a seminar on breathing in, on inhalation, on beautiful techniques of inhalation. Let's all focus about how to inhale. We've got to also think about how we exhale. And of course, that happens naturally in the body, in the system. And so inhalation gives us oxygen and life and fresh breath and exhalation dispels all the CO2. Both are highly necessary. Both are there. And it's us to find, it's for us to find our balance along that particular polarity. And, and so here are the six polarities. I'll illustrate these each uh, with potentially a photograph or something inspirational and maybe even a story uh, before we have a moment or two for some reflections or questions. And as Adam says, please do make use of the chat group. Uh, it might be through questions, comments, observations, reflections, whatever. It's lovely to get some sense of interaction uh, from you at AVT. And so polarity one, which I explore, is, is there a single version of the truth? Or of course, are there multiple truths? Of course, both are correct. Sometimes there is a single version of the truth. Uh, the sky is clear in Copenhagen today. It may not be later, and there may be multiple truths according to the weather. Um, there may be multiple truths when it comes to a particular question. At times, there are single truths, single truths. And yet, where are we finding our balance? And I'll explore this as we move into the seminar. The second uh, polarity that we'll explore is, is the world finite and limited? Or do we live in an infinite world? Now, of course, there are things that are finite and limited. Our time, my energy on this earth, uh, the earth itself, the planet, it's finite, right? It's not an infinite resource. I don't have all the time in the world. In this webinar, we've got 45 minutes. And so there's a finite concept of time. Yet there are infinite things around us, like love and appreciation and ability to give feedback and uh, trust, maybe, you know, what are these things that are infinite? Knowledge, isn't infinite, isn't knowledge infinite? I mean, this can be recorded and it can be sent out and we can learn together in an infinite fashion. And yet, isn't it interesting how often we treat the finite things as though they are infinite? We, we treat our time as though it's infinite and yet it is a finite concept. We, we say, I'll do it tomorrow. Or I'll bother that department, I'll keep bothering them, or I'll bother those people because surely their time is infinite, but their time is finite. We treat the finite things so often as though they're infinite, and then we treat the infinite things sometimes as though they're finite. I will only love you if, <laughs> I will only praise you if, I will only give you positive feedback if, and so I'll portion it out in a kind of a finite mindset. A third polarity that we'll explore together is, of course, the great question, which I believe was asked by Einstein, is that do we see the world as a friendly or an unfriendly place? This is one of the greatest decisions we ever make in our lives is do we see the world as unfriendly or do we see the world as friendly? Of course, both are true. And for me as a father, I need to find my balance with my teenage daughter along this particular polarity. I can't only be at one end of the scale. I can't live only at the one side of the extreme. If I tell my daughter that the world is only an unfriendly place, then think through the see, do, get. If that is her picture, that the world is so unfriendly, then what are her behaviors? Her behaviors are going to be, well, I'll never go out at night. I'll never have a boyfriend. I'll never drive a motor car. I won't even visit the local shopping center because, you know, somebody might rob me. Uh, or somebody might steal from me, or somebody might um, cheat me when I buy groceries. If that's her picture, then her behaviors are perfectly predictable. On the other side of the extremity, I can't either say that the world is completely friendly. I can't say to her that you should go out wherever you like, drive wherever you like, come home at whatever time you like, wear whatever you like when you go out. There will always be somebody to tuck you in at bed at night and nobody will ever spike your drinks. That may be irresponsible. And so somewhere she and I have to find our balance along that particular polarity. Sometimes the world is friendly. 
And sometimes the world is unfriendly. But do we see it through only one lens? Or are we willing every now and then to step back and pick up another set of lenses? The real premise of the book is, of course, that I will always behave, I will always do what I do if I continue to look through the same set of lenses. The moment I've got a choice, and that is a leadership initiative, I guess, or a leadership fundamental is that it is about choice, then at least I have another set of lenses through which to view the situation, to view the opportunity, or to view the potential crisis that we may be facing. Is the world friendly or is the world unfriendly? A fourth polarity is whether we see the world as superior or inferior. You know, are some of us better than others? Well, of course, that's true at times because some are better athletes and some are better cyclists and some are better divers and some are better swimmers and some are better readers and writers and, and some are better mothers and fathers maybe. But is the world around being superior or inferior? Or are we all truly unique? Do we have a unique set of lenses? Do we have a unique upbringing? Do we have a unique view of the world, a unique set of talents? Of course, the kickback to this used to be, well, we're all equal. Well, is that true too? Is that a, is that a, a valid lens? Maybe we have equal rights, but then we let's question that again. And if you are 16 in this country, you do not have equal rights. <laughs> you don't have equal rights to drink alcohol or to drive a car or to vote. And so maybe we have equal rights at certain times in our lives, but we are not equal as human beings. We are extraordinarily diverse and incredibly unique. And so again, both lenses may be pertinent here. A fifth one we'll explore is are we separate and disconnected? Um, that marketing never speaks to sales and no one ever speaks to finance. Are we siloed in our business? Are we siloed in our regions? Um, you know, I, we always, we, we laugh, Southern Johannesburg it always seems separate to Cape Town. <laughs> um, uh, Copenhagen is different to Jutland. Uh, you know, there's a sort of separateness there. There's like, no, those guys are very different. Uh, you know, it's very different to, to us and, and them. And of course, the Swedes are totally separate to us. But are we not also extraordinarily connected? And if this COVID experience is teaching the world something, it's perhaps that we are extraordinarily connected in this world. The last one we'll explore is that for sure power gets things done. There are times when power and authority and command and control and hierarchy, they may get things done. If you are lucky to be enough flying on an airplane somewhere, your pilot comes over the intercom in, a, in an emergency landing. Believe me, you're going to listen to him or to her and you're going to follow the rules. And he or she will use the power they have to get the plane on the ground safely. It's unlikely that they're going to walk through the aisles and ask for your opinion. And let's get a collaborative sense of how you'd like to do this. There will be some power, and that's a good thing. But generally, we also might be forgetting that there's a lens of energy and influence, that we can influence others to get things done without the use of title, without the use of power. And I think the world seems to be leaning more towards these pictures. For me, this became deeply personal because for the first half of my life, I lived in a country that was incredibly strong on these red pictures. The old South Africa was an apartheid system. And that apartheid system relied on a single version of the truth. And believe me, if you didn't believe in that version of the truth, there were strong consequences. It was about, there's a finite amount of power here and the white minority will control everything. Imagine a 12 to 15% minority ruling a majority with a finite sense of who's in power here. It was certainly an unfriendly place. Uh, it was a superior, inferior, picture that white was right <laughs> and it was highly separate and disconnected you lived in certain areas according to your skin color you were not allowed to work in other areas without permits beaches were banned for certain people of color certain uh, buses had categories of where you could sit and this happened right up into the early 1990s it was a place that was not afraid to use force 
and power. And based on those pictures, I spent two years of my life in the South African military defending these particular pictures. The extraordinary experience for me was that in 1989, a referendum happened and the release of Nelson Mandela was imminent in February of 1990. In 1989, I was still fighting uh, in an Angolan war and a Mozambique war, supporting a system that was prevalent around these pictures. And in February 1990, which is six weeks later, I'm celebrating the release of Nelson Mandela. I'm a student at the University of Cape Town. And for the first time in my life, I start seeing that potentially these blue pictures may also be relevant. I'd only ever seen the world through one set of pictures. And there are many stories, I hope, in the book that may inspire you to think through two sets of lenses here. Let's take each one very briefly and look at some photographs that may tell the story. Polarity one is, a, is it a single truth or a multiple truth? And the balance on this polarity hopes to support an idea of constant learning and innovation. If I only have a single version of the truth, how do I constantly learn? I can't innovate any further because I've got to a judgment. I'm no more curious because I've got the answer. There is a single version of the truth. That's okay. But can I also look at the lens? But maybe there's another way to do this. Could I not get a little closer to my client? I wonder if we might change our meetings around a little bit to get more truths, more multiple versions of people's opinions, thoughts, ideas. Because if there's a single version of the truth, then the meeting should be over. And it supports constant learning and innovation. Here's a picture for me, which really talks about a single version of the truth. It's not wrong. Uh, you know, music and, and orchestral music is magnificent to listen to. But to a large degree, the conductor has a single version of the truth. There is a script. You play exactly to according to the recipe. This is how loud you should play. This is when you should play. This is when you should stop playing. And to a large degree, that conductor has a hierarchy, a sense of control, and a sense of power, according to his single version of the truth. This is how this piece of music is going to be played. And they practice it, and they refine it, and they get it absolutely perfect to a single version of the truth. But have a look at that. Isn't there a difference? This is a jazz band outside Preservation Hall in New Orleans. They do agree on the song. They do agree potentially on the tone or the key in which the song should be played. But after that, it's exploratory. It's experimental. It's expressive. If this guy uh, misses a note or, or a key on his saxophone, th this guy here on his bugle will pick it up and, and jam with it a little. Uh, if this guy's getting a little tired playing his banjo, he probably reaches down and takes a sip underneath his chair of his margarita. <laughs> And these guys carry the music. There is no particular leader here. They jam off each other. They allow each other expression. I'm sure this guy's been having a look at what's in these bottles behind him. And there's a sense of fun and expression and no piece of jazz music is ever played in the same way twice. Adam will remember there's a wonderful place in Kultoven, I think it's called in Copenhagen, called the Havida Lam, the White Lamb. I hope it's still around because it's been around since the 1800s. So I have no uh, reason to believe it's not there. But what an extraordinary place. You walk in, it's 40 square meters, and there's a five-piece jazz band. And you can never have the same evening twice. <laughs> you, the music is different. The energy is different. People express themselves. And there are multiple versions of the truth. I wonder sometimes if we lead our organizations as orchestras, or whether we can't also look through the lens of a jazz band. Maybe there are multiple versions of the truth, allowing people's voices and expressions and interpretations to enter into the music. And, if, and in so doing, we can learn together. There's constant learning and innovation. How about polarity too? Is, the, is it a finite or an infinite place? Well, we really want to support more generosity and sharing. And so there's our planet, right? It's finite, and we're seeing that right now all over the world. More and more and more global climate change is destroying our planet. We are treating and have treated our planet as though it is an infinite resource. 
There will always be more. They will just do more mining, do more fracking, do more carbon emissions. There will always be more. The planet will provide. And perhaps now, for the first time, we are really seeing signs that this is not an infinite thing. We need to cherish those things that are finite. Our relationships, our time, our energy, and our planet. And yet, there are also infinite things, like relationships. Uh, there are infinite things like love, uh, and there are infinite things uh, like experiences. Long before Simon Sinek wrote the book on finite games, he was inspired by a man called James P. Koss in 1988, who wrote a piece called Finite and Infinite Games. Uh, and long before that, I had in my life a cousin who was what was called a finite, uh, sorry, an infinite player. He tragically died on his way to becoming head boy of a Pretoria Boys High School in South Africa at the age of 17. But before that was an absolutely fabulous squash player. My father, who's also called Colin and him, had a family connection and a family competition. And the, the goal was that if young Colin, Colin Jr., could beat Colin Sr. before he turned 16, then Colin Sr. would have to put an advert in the newspapers to say that Colin Jr. was a better squash player. And subsequently, too, if Colin Jr. could not beat Colin Sr., then Colin Jr. had to put an advert into the classifieds. For the first few years of their competition, when Colin Jr. was 13, 14, and in the early stages of 15, Colin Sr. used to beat him quite easily. He was much better at him. He was stronger. He was more wily, more sneaky. Until the day before Colin Jr. turned 16, which was his last opportunity, and he absolutely thrashed my father, Colin Sr. And for the first time in his life, Colin Sr. realized he had been played by an infinite player. Colin Jr. had wanted the game to continue. And he knew that the moment he beat Colin Sr., that particular bet was off. And he kept the game alive up until the very last moment. And, and that was a view of infinite thinking, that we can keep the game alive without having to win all the time. Polarity three is, is the world an unfriendly or a friendly place? And again, we just have to look around us to see how stark this polarity is. Two months ago in South Africa, uh, we saw so many photographs of this happening. Adam, right in the areas where you will have been, Phoenix, Bombay, Kwamashi. There were terrible, terrible riots that took place um, for a number of reasons. Notwithstanding, we have 34% unemployment in South Africa, 34%. And certain hotbeds welled up and riots and looting took place and malls were destroyed. Uh, and it was an extraordinary scene for four to five days of the South African police force, the South African army being, murdered, um, being uh, deployed into these townships, into these areas. And these were pictures of an unfriendly place, pictures of people stealing, pictures of people being shot, pictures of people protecting their assets. But at the same time, at the very same time, we saw this. We saw communities gathering together. We saw communities tidying up. We saw communities supporting each other with no help from government. We saw people getting together and saying, this is, this is our store. <laughs> it may belong to that owner, but this is where we shop. This is where we buy bread. This is where we buy milk. And, and we need to protect that asset. We need to tidy it up. We need to help that store owner get back on his feet so that we can go and buy our food again, so that we don't have to travel 30 kilometers to go and buy food. It was an extraordinary polarity of both a friendly and an unfriendly world. Have a look at polarity four with a few photographs. Are we separate and disconnected? Or are we infinitely connected? There's Trump's wall. <laughs> this is the wall between, or part of the wall between Mexico uh, and the US. Isn't that a picture of creating separateness and disconnected? And at times we feel as though we are separate and disconnected. And perhaps during COVID, we have really felt that in its extreme. But at the same time, we may also be infinitely connected. There's a wonderful African concept called Siriti, 
which is the shadow of your human being, of your metaphysical sense, the metaphysical shadow that you carry as a human being, your aura, your presence. And the thought is here that we are connected even through our shadows. <laughs> we are connected through our influence. We are connected. Uh, and again, COVID is certainly teaching us that. We think that this may be a human concept, and yet uh, we came across the most extraordinary story on one of our leadership weeks ran at Pinda Game Reserve at a small camp called Bayeti. It was midday around 10 o'clock, and there was a sudden commotion. Most of us were in class or listening to some thoughts together, and a commotion emerged because a hyena had got into one of the bathrooms. <laughs> And this meant that the local vet had to be called and had to dart this hyena. The hyena had been severely injured in a fight and had sought refuge in one of the delegates' bathrooms. <laughs> and so the class stopped, of course, while this hyena had been tranquilized and the vet started to work on this hyena with antibiotics and stitching. And he did an extraordinary job. And before the hyena recovered, he looked at this hyena and he said, you know, I still give this hyena only a 50% chance of survival. We asked, well, is that because of its injuries? He said, no. He said, well, haven't you done a good enough job? He said, no, I've done a great job. But its problem, its challenge is that it has lost its community. And a single hyena on its own has very little chance of survival. It has to have a community. It had been ousted by its community. It had lost its sense of connection. And its biggest threat was not its injuries, but its sense that it had lost its community. L lastly, uh, or second lastly, are we superior or inferior? Or are we unique? And how do we get a better sense of collaboration? And maybe I'll ask you on this webinar a quick question, and you can respond in the chat group. Uh, here's the question. Jackie Cochran, uh, C-O-C-H-R-A-N, Jackie Cochran, was the first woman to do what was the first woman to do what? Please don't try and Google this. Uh, you know, maybe you just know it. You can Google it later. But Jackie Cochran was the first woman to do what? Was it um, climb Mount Everest? Was it break the sound barrier? Was it visit the South Pole? Or was it to go into space? Give us your answer. Uh, and I was completely, for me, this was an embarrassing epiphany because I didn't know either. I had no idea, and worse than that, is that I didn't know the names of the women who had accomplished any of those other feats. I didn't know the first woman into space. I didn't know the first woman up Mount Everest. I didn't know the first woman to the South Pole. I didn't know the first woman to break the sound barrier. And yet, I knew all the men. And for me, it was this realization that perhaps I've also had this lens of superior and inferior. Why is it that I know all the stories of the men? But I don't know any of the stories of the women. And what is the uniqueness behind that? Could I not foster a better sense of collaboration if I changed my lens to saying we're all unique? You know, if I'm better than you, I have to be right. And therefore, why should I collaborate? But if you're unique and you have a different lens and I have a different skill, then surely collaboration must be an obvious way to go. And it comes to that, of course, we know that there are some athletes who are better than others. Have a look at the Olympic Games. But then we look at the world of snowflakes and we are told that even snowflakes, every single one of them are different. And so therefore, should we not also explore the world of uniqueness? And when we can, there may well be this opportunity to collaborate. Well, does power get things done? Yes, it does. Or could energy and influence get things done too? Um, how do we get a better sense of fully charged engagement in our teams and in our organizations? We know this picture. We've been in that picture. We may even have been on both sides of that picture. Yeah, and sometimes it works. Sometimes I have to shout at my 15-year-old son for not tidying up or not showering or not cleaning up after him or not doing his homework. <laughs> Uh, and that is a prevalent picture. There is still hierarchy and control and command and power. But if any of you are on this webinar and you have children, then those children influence your behavior 
and they have no power over you. They have no authority over you. And yet we will do the most extraordinary things for those children before they are even born. They are influencing our lives. And so maybe there is also this picture that energy and influence can get things done. We see this story all the time in South Africa. We see people with no positional power, no sense of authority, no support from government. We have 220,000 registered non-government organizations. And these are people trying to influence their communities, their schools, uh, their organizations without any help from the powers that be at a government level. And so maybe we explore this lens to say, I wonder if I'm not influencing through my energy or am I relying on my title, my authority, my power and my position a little too much. If I can influence through energy and through the influence itself, I can also get things done. And what we see are some extraordinary examples. And so Adam, I know our time is nearly up. It's uh, sort of four or five minutes to go. I'm coming off the uh, slide. And perhaps while I've been chatting, there've been a few thoughts in the chat group, or maybe there is a question from any of the delegates that are with us today. Uh, first of all, I can tell you that uh, when you asked the question before about what kind of achievement the lady had done, then you got all the questions or all the answers here. You got, you got like Everest and space and you got South Pole. So that was, uh, <laughs> that, was that far we went. <laughs> so, wow. Well, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you know, you're all wrong. <laughs> she was the first person to break the sound barrier. So first woman to break the sound barrier. And, and I just found this extraordinary as a, as a thought process as to why don't I know the story? Maybe at my lens has been, even without me realizing it, my lens has been that men are superior to women. You know, this is how I grew up in South Africa. You know, a white male was the ultimate being in South Africa. If you were black and female, you were, you know, considered inferior. And how extraordinary is that? And yet we're seeing some amazing stories of black females who are leading their communities. And Adam, who you have met, um, who teach children how to play chess, who build their own houses, um, who have saved 10,000 street children away from gangsterism, drugs, and prostitution by starting a place called the Home of Hope. Now, she has got no government funding, but what a leader. What an extraordinary example of leadership. Um, Steve, a, a question to you. Uh, now you have talked through the uh, this how can I say the, the concept and uh, the six polarities, but but how do you go around it yourself? Is it something you are aware of, or, or you are sometimes have to knock yourself a little bit, saying, "Okay, uh, am I too too much on one side and other side, or the, yeah, the ability to navigate there? How how do I do it?" So, yeah. Adam, it is. I think it for me did become an awareness. I I got quite a big wake-up call in 1990. Of course, when Nelson Mandela was released, I got a very similar wake-up call when I met Nelson Mandela. Uh, a long story, but in brief, I acted. I acted as my father's driver. He was invited to have breakfast with Nelson Mandela. And so I said, well, I'm coming with you. And my father said, you're not coming. You're not invited. And I said, well, I'll just be your driver. And within five minutes, my father came running back and said, the president wants to meet you. And in the simple words, he said, why is it that your father thinks we should leave a man in the parking lot when there is space around the breakfast table? And I had this opportunity to ask him and say, will my past be held against me in my future? You know, I've supported the South African Defense Force for two years. Uh, essentially supporting a system that was unjust and designed to keep people like you in prison. And very quietly, he said, you did what you did with the information you had at the time. The important thing is, what are you going to do from here? <laughs> and it was took me back to your beautiful um, philosopher, philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And so for me, it was an awareness and for me, my practice is it starts with a greeting. If we can greet somebody 
we stop the clock. And in that greeting, we establish a connection. The minute there's a connection, I'm slowly open to their story. And of course, after greeting, I must follow that with listening. Can I even listen to somebody for 30 seconds? <laughs> and how will that person be any richer for 30 seconds spent with me? So for me, the practice is, do I greet somebody? Because if I greet them, I can stop the clock. I can establish a connection. I can start a conversation. And if I can start a conversation, we can build a relationship, even if it's in just a matter of minutes. I think the third step after greeting and listening is sharing. And when I tell that story, it reinforces the pictures that perhaps the world is not so unfriendly. Perhaps there is also a friendly picture here. Perhaps there's also a friendly story. There's also a connected story as opposed to a separate and disconnected. Perhaps there's a story of energy as opposed to only a story of power and control. Mm. I hope that helps. Thank you. Actually, I think we should check. I know that the time is running, but I've just got uh, another question in here. Actually, got quite a few, but I think we'll just check this one here and then we can finish off. And it, it's ask you, you have extraordinary nature and wildlife in South Africa. What can being the nature be used in your personal development as a leader? Can you reflect that? And, uh, and how do you see it? Well, Casper, I see that's from you. What an amazing question. And yeah, absolutely, nature teaches us so much. You know, we conceptually, conceptually think that this VUCA world um, is, is a human construct, that it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I, I'm sure you've come across that term, that acronym, the VUCA world, right? It's, it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Well, nature teaches us that all the time. Nature's never the same. It's always volatile. We have different extremes in the weather, in rainfall, in fires, and yet it manages it. It's uncertain. We don't know really what's going to happen tomorrow with the lion and the impala. For the impala, life is uncertain. For the lion, the life is uncertain too. It's complex because a small change in the environment can lead to massive changes across, across the, the, the area. And it's ambiguous. There may be more than one answer. Yet nature finds a way without any power. Nature is all about energy. Nature is all about the use of energy. Everything interacts in nature because of this concept of energy. So where could we learn from nature? And one of the things, hopefully, Casper, you might do is come tracking with us one day. <laughs> and when you go tracking, it is all about reading the signs of our environment. And isn't that what we're doing as leaders? Isn't that what we hope to be doing? We're looking for signs and signals and clues that should be there and those that shouldn't be there. And there's a fabulous phrase in tracking called the path of not here. It's great information to know that the animal has not moved here. And yet, how much time and energy and information and money are we sinking into certain projects, even when we know it's not the right thing to do? We get trapped into the sunk cost trap. And, and so maybe nature teaches us that we could look through another path. We could follow different things. We could get into the mind of the customer of the animal and try and follow what they're doing so that we can best serve them. Nature has many, many lessons. And maybe that's the subject of another webinar, Adam. I think so, because uh, and that's also to our um, to our participants that, that of course that, that we do uh, study field tours to uh, South Africa, and I'm sure that we can uh, that we will be able also to meet Steve there because uh, that's our plan to, that's to uh, to start up again, hopefully on the other side of COVID and uh, whatever we have to wait for. But but Steve. This has been awesome. It's been great to have you back here. And uh, thank you for taking your time to present, you know, concepts from your book and, um, and your great stories. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's an exciting concept that we all can take into ourselves. Uh, and I'm, I know I trust that we will see each other soon again. And uh, of course, also to all of you who have been listening, uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know that your book can be found on Amazon. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can go there and read much more there. I hope you have enjoyed it and uh, have a great day. It was, it was great to all of you. And thank you again, Steve. Well, thank you, Adam. And thank you to AVT and for all your time and energy. Uh, have a wonderful week ahead. And yes, absolutely, Adam. Cannot wait to reconnect physically again, either back in Copenhagen or in South Africa or in the bush or wherever. It's been an extraordinary privilege to have known you, Adam, 
and the relationship that started from a simple greeting, I think is testament to how we've both been able to see the world through different lenses. Yeah. So go out there and greet, listen and share. And maybe those are three great steps that allow us to see the world through different lenses. Thanks to everybody. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.